rugby. A game of emotion, power, strength and speed. A game for everyone. But is the game we all love and enjoy today too unsafe to play? Rugby is a game that I love with all my heart, but there are elements of rugby that are seriously dangerous. You've got to be pretty brave to go out there and, and play this game. After a World Cup that saw a record number of red cards dominated by head contact and dangerous tackles, head injuries and concussion cast a dark cloud over the sport. The physical side of it is no less dangerous than sitting in your bedroom playing Xbox for the rest of your life. With every player in the game getting bigger, faster, stronger every season, the hits are only going to get bigger. Some say rugby has gone soft. Others think it needs to be softer. But has the game evolved so much that head injuries are just a part of the sport so many know and love? He's pretty much concussed before he hits the ground. Hello, Malu. To the Tavaki. Look at Nonnen. He's gone straight down. I remember going right back to probably when I was about 16 was probably the first real big concussion I remember. Uh, when concussion really wasn't a thing back then. And I went to hit somebody whose knee hit me in the chin and I was completely out cold. Next thing I know, I remember waking up in an ambulance. But back then it was, okay, he's absolutely fine. You can probably play the next week. Um, and I, I didn't have many concussions then for the next few years. And then I started noticing them then uh, while I was playing for the Dragons. I started to pick up a few big ones and have one of them I spent overnight in hospital with. And even then, okay, the, the technology and our understanding of concussion had moved on, but it was still a case of, what's the score? Where are you? Okay, he must, must be okay, carry on. But then towards the later part of my career when I was 25, 26, um, again, I received some big, big blows. And at that point, we, we understand it enough then to know that this isn't right, it's getting worse and decisions have to be made. Superb try from the Dragons! Adam Hughes, a Dragon Centurion, an Anglo-Welsh runner-up and an age-grade Welsh international. A player full of promise and with years in the back line ahead of him. Or so it seemed. In September 2017, at just 26 years of age, Adam stepped onto a rugby field as a player for the final time. After two years of repeated concussions, Adam was forced to retire from the game he so dearly loved. Adam is just one of 56 professional rugby players in the last decade to have publicly announced their retirement as a result of concussion. And it seems more and more that players are being forced to put their own welfare ahead of the sport. A concussion is a, a contra coup injury, meaning it's a type of accelerational injury whereby the brain tissue will accelerate from its position and almost rebound against the skull. So you get damage along the peripheral aspects of the brain as a result of it making contact with the skull itself. The people that sustain that injury often present with symptoms, which include things like amnesia, so difficulty with remembering, uh, balance deficits, uh, dizziness, different arrays of symptoms associated with different brain regions. Concussion is the invisible injury. No coach, no, no physio, no UK leading neurosurgeon can look at you and tell you you're not right. It's just completely up to the player. The neurosurgeons and, and the physios and the doctors have to work off what you're telling them. So everything comes down to the player for the longevity of his health and career. He has to make that decision and, and be honest with how he's feeling. Two years on from retiring, Adam visits the Neurovascular Research Lab at the University of South Wales to undergo a series of measurements and tests designed to assess his overall brain function. 
Comparing Adam's baseline results to other formerly concussed players will allow researcher Tom Owen to observe just how well Adam's brain is functioning. How many diagnosed concussions have you had in the past? Eight. Superb. And when was the most recent concussion? 2017. 2017. Okay. And how long was the recovery of the most recent concussion? Uh, it's ongoing, really. Ongoing. But, yeah. Okay. It's a step-by-step -step process to returning from concussion. The first stage is, is symptoms. If you have any symptoms at all, at all, you can't move to step two. Stage two would be certain forms of physical um, performance. So that could be on a bike, do some running, do some swimming. And if you have any symptoms of doing any of those, then you go right this way back to stage one. Stage three, contact, and then stage four, sort of game scenario. So at any point you fail, you go back to stage one. Uh, which goes to show that you, know, you can spend a long time building yourself up, but if at any point you get those symptoms, you end up right back to the start, I guess. There is no easy way to detect a concussion in terms of sound physiological tests. There are a number of tests whereby we can help characterise symptoms associated with concussion, and particularly within rugby, we look at things like the HIA or the SCAT. Uh, sports concussion assessment tools in order to help us. At the moment, there is no consensus in terms of how sensitive these measurements are um, and as a result that's one of the biggest challenges we face in order to detect concussion. Now I'm going to test your memory. I will read you a list of words. I'd like you to repeat back as many of the words as you can remember in any order, even if you said the word before. Finger Penny, blanket, lemon, insect, candle, paper, sugar, sandwich, wagon. Sandwich wagon, finger penny, sugar, finger penny. That's it. Good stuff. The SCAT-5 test assesses basic cognitive functions of memory, balance, coordination and attention. It's commonly used during a head injury assessment, a HIA. Today it is the tool that allows Tom Owen to establish any prolonged concussion symptomology since Adam's rugby career ended little over 24 months ago. Now I'm going to assess your concentration. I'm going to read you a list of numbers and when I'm done I'd like you to repeat them back to me in the reverse order of how I read them to. Okay. For example, if I said 719, you would say 917. Exactly. 493. 394. 629. 7, 9. 9, 7, 2, 3. Good stuff, well done. Okay, so do you remember that list of words that I read to you a few times earlier? I'd like you to try and remember as many of those words as you can in any order. Oh, finger paper, sugar, sandwich, that's it. Okay, no problem, good stuff. Adam is about to undertake one final test. This will establish the speed at which blood flows through the middle cerebral artery. This helps provide the brain with enough oxygen to function and control the body. Data has shown that players present with impaired cerebral blood flow following a concussion. So a good result after this test might just indicate improvement in the two years that Adam has not played rugby. We're all, we've all got this transtemporal window. The transtemporal window itself is like a narrowing of the bone in the skull. Right. Um, and that allows us to ultimately fire the ultrasound beam through it. Okay. Um, but if it's thicker, then we can't, the ultrasound beam can't, can't pass through it. Okay. Um, and that's some of the issues that we've had, particularly with rugby players, is yeah. obviously if they've been in the scrums a lot. Uh, in particular, then we see that they typically present with greater calcification. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is if you keep looking uh, straight ahead for me, yeah. we're just going to try and locate this signal on the side of your head. Okay. 
feeling quite positive ahead of the tests. Uh, there's a lot that we can learn from them or I can learn from them as well. Peace of mind would be good just to see if there was any sort of positive recovery uh, rather than any sort of degenerative uh, sort of outcomes on it would be obviously disappointing. But uh, if I can see that, I, you know, I've refrained from doing anything which could cause concussions since I retired. Um, so if I can see a positive outcome from that, I'd be happy. So that constant whooshing noise that you can hear is every time your heart beats, it sends blood flow through your body and this is what's arriving towards your brain. So we're going to place that mouthpiece in and then we're going to attach a bag onto this part of the mouthpiece and that's the bag with 5% carbon dioxide. So again, exactly the same amount of oxygen as what we're breathing right now, just a little bit more CO2. What that does is increase blood flow around your body. Typically, as a result of that, you feel like you need to breathe a little bit more quickly or you might feel like you need to take deeper breaths. Completely normal, but if it does get too discomforting, please do let us know with a thumbs down and we'll stop. Okay, so we're just going to place that in now then. Good stuff. What I'll do is slide this on to the end of your mouthpiece, okay? So you're still going to be breathing normal room air at this point. Whenever you're ready then, eyes closed and we'll get going. Three, two, one, and start there. So you're now going to be breathing in that gas. Might feel like you need to breathe a little bit deeper. Your brain is not as reactive to these CO2 challenges as non-concussed individual. Therefore, we'd conclude based off these measurements that your brain is performing to a good or even high level looking at how your brain functions cognitively and yeah. how well it, it can manage blood flow to itself. Yeah. It's definitely a positive aspect that I hope Brilliant. that you can take away from today at least. Yeah. So what is this showing that players, or people who play contact sport, are suffering? Anyone that has had a concussion, it does seem that we're seeing a, an increased likelihood towards a decline in cerebral blood flow or, or blood flow to the brain. Yeah. Um, and that's probably as a result of changes that occur in our blood or molecular changes that occur in our brain as a result yeah. of that concussion. If we've got less blood flow traveling to the brain, yeah. the chances are we've got less oxygen delivery to the brain. Uh, yeah. And this is what links with a reduction in cognitive function because yeah. if we haven't got sufficient oxygen delivery, yeah. our brain cannot function to its highest capacity yeah. and therefore we get a reduction That's in cognitive right. function. Yeah. Um, okay. The biggest thing that seems to be apparent at the moment is the neuroprotective benefits of physical activity. Yeah. So the longer that you can maintain a physically active lifestyle, um, the more likely you are to enjoy a, a, the benefits of, of good physiological function in terms of molecular yeah. uh, and, and brain function. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. In two years, Adam has gone from rock bottom, struggling with memory loss and concentration, to now showing no clear signs of concussion symptomology. And just as importantly, no obvious deterioration in his brain function. So how can we help players of the present and future identify concussion and minimise the risk? Welsh company Protect claims they have the know-how and the technology to do so. Their gum shield device can detect any measurement associated with head impact. This allows medics to record an impact to the head in real time and react to peaked measurements to remove the player from the rugby field immediately. Until now, there's been nothing that would accurately monitor exactly what's going on in a collision to a player's head, you know, and, and quantify what that head, head impact actually meant. This is the, the first tool that we've had available to do that. Will it make the game safer? We believe so, because if we can actively manage um, the loadings on a player in terms of how much exposure uh, that they're, they're receiving, then if we can manage that and make sure that you know, they're not exposed to too much, then potentially we can make them um, fresher, you know, prolong their career, you know, make them available for more matches essentially, which is, which is what it's all about. The data that we find from this will help to evolve the game and there's going to be more technology that comes along that evolves the game. So, you know, who knows what direction the game will go in 20 years. Um, I think the most important thing is that the game is still there in 20 years and that people still want to play it and, and the players are safe. And essentially that, that's what we're trying to do.
So I, I think we're using technology in the best way possible at the moment, but you can be as technologically advanced as you want. Everything comes down to what the player tells you, unfortunately. You can have gum shields in, you can have certain monitors on, but it's up to the player to tell you, I took this knot, and it might even be a big knock, because it's not always the biggest knocks that cause the, the, you know, the worst concussion. But I've had this knock, and this is how I'm feeling. So the, you know, the most technology we can use is the player himself. I think we'll see an even bigger push towards more safety. I just hope, as I said, that it doesn't detract too far from the core physical nature of rugby. And I hope rugby can find a common sense balance so that it doesn't lose its core values and that we, we find a sensible way forward that protects the health of players. No one should die in a rugby field, but at the same time we all, as players or anyone involved in the game, signs up to a contract that when you take that field you know the risks involved. You see some of the way some people are still tackling and it does make you wince because you know the effects you've had and you just hope it doesn't happen to anyone else. But weirdly enough, I actually enjoy watching rugby more now than I did when I played. You don't have that worry of you've just seen a huge hit, somebody get really hurt on the field. That could happen to me next week. For me, that's not an issue anymore. When I played, I, I knew what my strengths and weaknesses were. I was never the biggest player on the field, so it was a case of I had to go into everything 100% if I was going to have any effect at all. And uh, uh, no, I wouldn't change it. It's just unfortunate. These things, you, you, you can't, you don't know they're going to happen. Nobody does anything on purpose. Um, and just unfortunately, I came out on the worst of, of some contacts and um, bore the brunt of them. And unfortunately, it just meant I had to retire a few years early, but it's not the end of the world. I, I had a really good nine, 10 years, so I wouldn't change a thing. I'd never stop anyone uh, of my friends and family playing rugby because I honestly believe that the positives far outweigh the negative. The social side of it is huge, and the friends you make, the networks you create, and the memories uh, will, will live for you forever. It's reassuring that the organisations and the unions are taking proactive steps to try and reduce any, uh, any injuries and make the game safer for especially kids. Uh, and that will continue, and as long as it continues, I'll have no problem at all with my, any of my family members playing.